This webinar is being recorded. So for those of you that don't know, we take it, we'll do a little bit of light editing and then it gets posted to uh, YouTube uh, and it's available for folks. Uh, I'll also run a quick um, uh, uh, recognition on the uh, content. So there is also an a, a accompanying transcription of it. Um, for everybody that is joining, uh, just so that you're aware, um, chat is not private, even if you think it is, if you're sending it directly. So please be conscious of that. Uh, you all have your own personal controls for your microphone, video. Uh, please be conscious of that. If I see anybody that's bubbling up, um, I will mute you. It's nothing personal, um, except for you, Doug. It's always personal with you, just so that you know. Um, I was just going to let everybody know that we're selling their data too, so. <laughs> so, um, and then uh, from a question and answer standpoint, um, we, uh, we have the chat. You can obviously send the chat to everybody. That's okay. Uh, if you're not comfortable raising your hand, which you can also do through the controls, and I'll try and call on people when we get to that stage. Um, then uh, you know, feel free to put it in the chat, um, but you can also raise your hand and I'll try and keep uh, uh, coordination on that. Otherwise, I'm gonna hand it over to Jim, who's just gonna do the usual introduction. Um, then we'll get into uh, the program. I know David's got some thoughts and uh, I'll just say up front, David, I'm sorry, I still haven't gotten around to uh, sending my money across, but I, I, I've, I've had a reminder, I've just been a little bit tied up. <laughs> no problem. Okay, well, we'll be minimizing Nick's window until we actually get his dues payment. So we'll be shrinking. Good luck with that. I control everything here, remember? <laughs> In front of our very eyes. But hello, everybody. We're, uh, I, we're going to be quick with the upfront information because we really want to get onto this program. I think it's going to be really interesting. Uh, thanks to Linda Siegel for arranging the, the speakers, and, and we're, we're looking forward to that. Just a couple of previews next month. We're going to be talking about behavioral health. Doug Goldstein is going to uh, be shepherding that program. And the, the little teaser he gave me earlier was that behavioral health is not just health. Uh, and so- it's Just health. Behavioral health is just, it should see, be a I knew I'd get it wrong. not a carve out. <laughs> okay. All right. At any rate, uh, we're looking forward to that in May. Uh, David is taking the lead to talk about changes in healthcare policy. We have a new- uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services, I guess we just confirmed yesterday. So we'll be looking at what that may mean for uh, healthcare and health technology coming up. Uh, in June, Ann Rosenblum and Richard Singerman uh, have arranged a really interesting program on climate change and its effect on public health. And July, we'll be looking at uh, COVID and the long-term implications for patient and providers. Uh, Deanne Kasim and Sunidhi Pankshay will be taking the lead on that. Uh, so uh, that we've got some interesting programs coming up. Uh, as always, we're flexible. So if something changes at the last minute or some uh, really uh, unforeseen thing happens, which seems to occur with great regularity, we may shift those around a bit. But uh, that's our plan for the moment. And with that, uh, before we get into the program, let me turn it over to David, because I think you had a couple of points you wanted to mention. Just a quick announcement. Uh, as, as most of you know, we have a website at helptechnet.net. It's sponsored by um, Nelson Mullins. And I got the word the other day that Nelson Mullins is upgrading its website uh, to make it more secure and to make it more efficient. Um, the, the Health Tech Net website has not been revamped in a long time. It, it's essentially the same format we've always used going, going back um, more than a decade uh, when I was at Pillsbury and we got it just, we, we transferred it over to Nelson Mullins, but right now, we have an opportunity to take a look at it and see if we want to expand or update it. Um, in the early days, we uh, had thought that we might post articles of interest, uh, events that are coming up, things like that. We have not been able to keep that very well up to date. And of course, as has been noted, the list of members uh, keeps growing, but almost nobody ever, we, we almost never drop anybody, whether they've retired or moved on or, or what. So we need some, to do some editing um, and so uh, Jim and I talked about this and thought we might see if there are, is anyone in the group, uh, maybe one or two people who would be interested in, who, who know about websites and would be interested in taking a look at this 
and working perhaps with the program committee to try to uh, evaluate and update the site so that it's uh, so that it's more useful. We don't want to make it overly complicated or create a lot of work for ourselves, but um, since it's being uh, reviewed anyway by the firm, um, if you have any interest in uh, doing that, feel free to let me know, um, and um, we'll have a little subcommittee here uh, to, to to do that. That's all I had. Feel free to email me if you um, if you'd like to uh, participate in that. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, David. Well, with that, let me turn it over to Linda Siegel to introduce the topic and introduce our speakers and kick the program off. Thanks, Jim. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, today, we will explore telehealth and what has happened to it over the past year of a pandemic. But before we start, let me introduce our panelists. Dr. Jason Singh joined Kaiser Permanente of the Mid-Atlantic region in 2015 as an internal medicine physician shortly after finishing his medical residency training at the University of Maryland. In his leadership role of physician site lead and assistant chief of adult and family medicine in Manassas, Haymarket, Crossroads, and Fair Oaks, he provides overarching support across multi-center facilities. His focus is strategic planning and clinical operations, business partnership, and quality and service delivery. Dr. Singh also serves as an advisor for end use technology implementation into day-to-day -day operations, resource management and center-based projects. And he sees patients daily. Um, Dr. Dennis V. Trong has been with the Mid-Atlantic Permanente Medical Group as an emergency medicine physician since 2010. Dr. Trong provides hands-on patient care at the Kaiser Permanente Urgent Cares and Clinical Decision Units, and he also treats patients virtually through KP's Video Visits Program. In addition to his patient care work, Dr. Trong ha has been appointed to numerous leadership positions. His leadership roles began in the areas of KP's electronic medical record, the clinical contact center, and physician education and quality improvement. He was named Regional Director of Telemedicine Mobility in May 2014, gaining accountability for existing programs and future roadmap of services. In May 2016, he additionally assumed the role of the Assistant Physician-in-Chief for Capital Planning and Innovations for the Northern Virginia Service Area. He also serves as a member of the National Quality Forum Telehealth Committee, the National Academy of Medicine, KP's National Telehealth Leadership Team, Digital Care Advisory Group, and KP Innovation Advisory Group. And I wonder how he ever has time to actually even do his job after all that. Um, he has presented at numerous conferences and conventions, and he has been featured in various publications. He created Kaiser Permanente's Mid-Atlantic States Telehealth Program in which he spent the last seven years architecting and implementing its portfolio of integrated telehealth and digital solutions. And since the advent of COVID-19, the Mid-Atlantic States region has provided over 2 million encounters virtually and has experienced a sustained healthcare delivery transformation where over 50% of all patient encounters occur via virtual care. Dr. Trong is a veteran of the United States Air Force. And upon completing his military commitment, he split time between the Veteran Affairs Medical Center in Palo Alto and the Permanente Medical Group in Walnut Creek, California. He received his physician executive MBA from the University of Tennessee. He got his medical degree from Michigan State Me um, Med Medical School and he's a board certified emergency medicine physician licensed in nine states. Jared Ula is CEO and founder of Health Talk AI, which is a company focused on improving access to care, scaling care, coordination, and enhancing patient satisfaction and loyalty. He has over 20 years of clinical and healthcare product management experience, defining, building, and supporting market leading software and health information technology. Jared started his healthcare career at the bedside working as a neonatal intensive care nurse at a level four NICU. 
His passion for technology and healthcare led him to work for Inova Health System as a senior analyst and clinical technologist, implementing and sustaining multiple clinical applications. Jared has also served in leadership roles in product management and product marketing for several leading health tech, tech companies, including CareFusion, GetWell Network, Zebra Technologies. And I think it's Vimed, is that the way it's pronounced? Um, Jared's blend of product management and healthcare subject matter expert allow him to continue to shape solutions that resonate in the healthcare market. So gentlemen, this year has definitely been tumultuous in many ways and healthcare didn't escape. How has healthcare medicine or telemedicine changed over the past year in terms of its demand and its importance? Who wants to start? I can start actually. Um, uh, first of all, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, really glad to be a part of the uh, conversation. And uh, thanks, Linda, for the uh, for, for the platform and the introduction. Um, happy to talk about my practice, especially you know during this pandemic and how we've uh, essentially optimized information and technology. I think just kind of going back, I think to understand how innovation in generally works, right? We we plan, we get a proof of concept, we implement, and then of course the right spark needs to happen before it becomes widespread. So for us, the pandemic was that spark. It was that catalyst, and it's been incredibly transformational, I would say, for me, my practice, our organization at large. Um, you know, what was great for us is our organization had previously invested so much capital and resources into information technology and telemedicine uh, many years ago to provide that added access and convenience to our patients. And so majority of us in primary care, as, as even uh, Dr. Dennis Tronkin alluded to, we were already doing telemedicine. We were doing video visits and using tools such as uh, remote monitoring of blood pressures and, and glucometers. So the pandemic quite honestly, just positioned us to respond very quickly without as much of the growing pains that may, perhaps some of the other organizations may have experienced last year. So it quite honestly was a smooth transition uh, to ramp up what we were already doing and doing successfully. So um, it's just more of, uh, more of the day-to-day -day stuff that kind of got ramped up. A lot of our physicians that were seeing patients in the office every day started to have hybrid schedules. We were doing two to three days now uh, in clinic and then two to three days of just dedicated virtual days for our patients. Um, Dennis, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, we started uh, we started telehealth as Jason alluded to at Kaiser Permanente Mid-Atlantic about well, seven, eight years ago. And this one quote I always go back to because um, I just really fondly believe in it is that uh, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. So, you know, we, I think we all sit here and, uh, and we, we talk about healthcare, we talk about technology, and we talk about the opportunities out there. You know, how do we prepare for what's next? You know, who would have ever thought in our lifetime we'd have a pandemic of, of, this, uh, of this magnitude causing so much uh, a disruption to, to, to healthcare? And, you know, as, as Jason says, it became a catalyst for us and that we, we were already doing it for a long time. We were doing all the asynchronous, synchronous, remote patient monitoring and, uh, and M health for many years. But when, when the pandemic hit, all it did was allow us to um, uh, ignite, I guess you're saying the spark that allowed us to increase our virtual visits by 3,700% like many other groups experience. Uh, and then it, a good point to it is that the fact that we, we architected this a long time ago. So, you know, you, you think about now, every healthcare system had to go to virtual because they're an line incentive of safety and social distancing uh, around March or April of last year. But which groups were able to sustain it, sustain that transformation? I think I'm very proud that our organization has actually, we settled at a little, little bit over 50% of our patient encounters are still virtual, even for the past nine months, uh, as we reopen and as we're providing more access to, to our patients um, with the same amount of resources. So it's, it's amazing how technology can really, uh, can really uh, change the game and raise that ceiling for us. And uh, I think it sets a whole new standard for, uh, for healthcare now. Jared, um, you certainly benefited from this uh, shift to telemedicine. You were able to do a one, one and a half million dollar raise recently. Can you um, elaborate on what Health Talk is all about and how this has affected you? 
Yeah, so <clears throat> Health Talk is really, I founded the company really around access, right? Is is really where our mission is to give every patient the access that they deserve uh, whenever it is to the providers. And I think providers uh, want that as well. I think that in terms of the pandemic, uh, what happened was is, is alignment, right? I think not every organization, um, big or small, actually has the the infrastructure and the capital that KP has. I think we have a lot to learn from KP for sure, uh, but they were already leaning in hard as, as, uh, as Jason and Dennis said. It, um, it's been a, a struggle up until now with adoption of technology. And it's just healthcare is one of those industries is, and I think it comes from, you know, um, physicians being trained by other great physicians and, and um, that over, overall adoption has been like, well, why do we need to change? And like uh, Jason talked about, this was the catalyst that just aligned all those incentives, right? From patient, from a patient perspective, from a physician perspective, and all the way down. Whether you were two docs or KP, how am I going to see patients that now, now that my office is closed? And guess what? They need to see me more than ever. So, and and on top of that, we had the regulations that changed that allowed that to happen so that they essentially could get reimbursed. So we had the alignment from a financial perspective, from a patient perspective, and a provider that provider perspective that may have been pushing back on telehealth or virtual care just because they they like doing the way, the business way they work. That that's what happened with this uh, pandemic. I like to talk about before COVID, after COVID, BC and AC, and I think we're living in a, in an AC world that that really will never, never go back. Well, according to a study from RAND, the biggest uptick in telehealth usage over the past year has been in affluent urban areas. For instance, one of the things that they found was that metropolitan areas had about 50 telemedicine visits per 10,000 people compared to 31 visits per 10,000 people in rural areas. And, um, I think most people assumed that it was going to be the rural areas that were going to grow faster. Um, did you find a difference among the regions in usage? For me, for me, we actually, we we actually saw um, the opposite, right? And because uh, with telehealth is great, but some of the problems that that Health Talk helps with is the administrative workload before and after. And so we use bot technology that allows that to happen via text message. So um, a lot of rural folks, our customers, uh, health centers alike, um, said, saw the synergy of, of, of essentially the, the evolution of well, what after, what's gonna happen after COVID. And a lot of folks were like, well, rural anyway, we're solving a problem today that we should have probably solved a long time ago, but we see a future in terms of that. So. Um, my experience personally is that the the rural population uh, is hungry for this technology as well. I mean that that study is really interesting. Um, I think we need to study it more. We need more studies that that help us show in terms of the access um, of, of folks in rural versus metropolitan. I think we need to understand why that is. Uh, Dennis, Jason, did have you seen a, a difference among your patients or among? Um, the KP organization across the board? I think it's a little different uh, KP because many, many of, the, of KP central locations are in the, the urban areas. Although we do have patients all in surrounding uh, West Virginia, Pennsylvania and, and those areas. But it's an interesting statistic that you just uh, mentioned there, Linda, because if you think about um, the use of telehealth for what you're saying, it's, it's, that's also where, where there's a digital divide, right? That's where, where broadband doesn't reach some of these rural areas quite as well. But also one thing that's never, that's never really mentioned is digital fluency. Uh, we don't talk about education and marketing of telehealth very much in many of these rural areas. It's very um, traditional how, how the, the culture is about you know, the, the brick and mortars coming into the ER or your primary care doctor that you've known for 20 something years. That, that seems to be more of what I'm hearing in those areas. But when we talk about telehealth, I think that's where it's really important to offer different choices, right? Where Maybe you don't have broadband. Maybe a video visit isn't what, what you're, uh, you're accustomed to or open to, but to have other uh, modalities of telehealth, right? Secure messaging with, with your uh, physician, uh, e-visits. Those are things where you have questionnaires that 
uh, have targeted medical questions that a physician can react to. Because uh, those are the same questions we ask when, when we see you in the, in the clinic or in telehealth anyways. Um, and then, you know, the, the texting mechanism like Jared's co company has, I think those things also add choice and, and it kind of broadens the, the spectrum of telehealth that's available for even uh, patients that are in the rural areas that may not have the, the strong broadband or, or digital fluency um, as in some of the urban areas. Dennis, you brought up um, the whole thing of security. And I know that um, SMS texting is not secure, but it works mm -hmm. uh, when a patient needs to reach a doctor. So what are you actually doing or what have you done? And, and Jared, what have some of your um, physician groups done about safety and security? Yeah, I think Jared's going to be able to talk better about this, but as far as from our organization at Kaiser Permanente, we use SMS texting more for patient notifications, uh, reminders about the upcoming appointments, right? When we actually text um, our member, I mean, me and Jason do this many, many times a day, we, we actually text on a secure platform. So by texting on that secure platform, the patient has to click on and then go into a, a secure browsing text uh, platform. So at least they know, they know one is, Dr. Jason Singh would like to send you a text. You click on there and opens up and then, then the conversation is in a secure environment. Um, so that's what we do at, at Kaiser Permanente probably about 20,000 times a month. Very interesting. Um, almost like the secure emails I get from my investment advisor. Yeah, you have to click and put on some kind of, some kind of encrypted password or something to get, get by. Right, right. Yeah. When they're sending me documents, um, they, they send it through a secure email. Um, Jared, what have you found amongst your medical system, your physician systems, and, and um, are you working with any doctors, one on, just lone or solo practitioners? Uh, most of our customers are around, you know, 10 to 70 providers, right? Okay. So that's usually where we're at um, in terms of uh, our customers. No, I think that that's the other thing that, that's, that's happened during this pandemic is, um, we use a bot technology, right? That automates the conversation that identifies gaps in care, um, really based on the, what the provider's looking for. Uh, what we've learned is, is that patients love it, right? They love being able to text um, the system to be able to engage uh, with, their, with their providers. What we've also learned is that um, the, the system, the, the system in terms of HIPAA, um, hasn't broken down, right? And we were, we've been all worried as we should around the security component of it, but you can have a conversation with the patient, an automated conversation with the patient that is HIPAA compliant, but also very clinically relevant. And I'll give you an example. Example is a patient with, that has diabetes. We talk about in terms of, did you check your blood sugar today? But we don't, we wouldn't say something like, what have you gotten your A1C checked, right? So there's this balance between security and clinically relevant that we kind of play. And ultimately it's up to our providers. Our providers have the ability to change the messaging to what the, to their comfort level. And if they don't, if they're not comfortable talking about something um, in the system, they don't. So I think what we've learned overall is, is, is the sky hasn't fallen right in terms of SMS and texting patients and that patients love it. Um, and the patients, most patients would, uh, regardless, a lot of studies out there now, most patients would rather text or provider, regardless of the diagnosis. Tell, talk about my diet. I don't care. I just want to be able to, to connect with my, with my doctor. Um, so I think that's what we learned is that we can, we can have a conversation with the patient, um, respect that privacy, but also be cl clinically relevant as well. Jason, have you found any um, resistance or problems with your patients? I mean, where they still want to come in and see you when they could do it um, virtually? Or do you, have you found that maybe they don't have the technology or the facility, the, the ease of use with the technology? So, you know, majority of our patients uh, connect with us through um, our portal platform, right? Through our website, kp.org or through the KP app. Um, you know, we realize not everyone has a computer, but most folks actually have a phone. And so through that app, they're able to, you know, schedule visits. They can literally go into my schedule and book themselves a visit, uh, whether it's face-to-face, -face, a virtual visit, um, a telephone, 
send me an email, uh, follow up on a lab result that they had a question about, or if they need refills on their prescriptions, they can do all that through their app. Um, and that automates everything for them. Uh, they can even get their prescription sent and delivered to their home for free if they wanted to. And so a lot of our patients actually really appreciate having options because the goal is not to shift one visit to another, but to give an array of options. Here's the information we have. And so when the pandemic first you know, uh, was widespread, uh, there was this notion of, hey, I want to minimize my exposure of coming into the clinic. Uh, and so this gave that added sort of security, that feeling that we can do a video visit um, through their phone or, or a telephonic uh, appointment or, or even an email secure message back and forth. So that, that was really helpful for us. Um, even just with acute conditions as well, some folks are not sure, hey, is this an issue that I can let it run its course, or do I need to escalate? Can I get a doctor's advice on this? So we have uh, questionnaires, as, as Dennis was talking about, that are built into our system for acute conditions. And this allowed us to automate triaging and streamline the right disposition for our patients. So not everyone needed to be seen in clinic. And those are the ones we could easily just call over the phone or, or do a quick virtual visit. Um, and then uh, assess what's going on. And if they do need to be seen, we can make arrangements for that as well. So it's just that added um, safety for our patients. Uh, and to be quite honest, uh, it, it's a huge uh, satisfier for our patients as well. We internally look at our own um, satisfaction rates and um, we've noticed that uh, patients actually prefer virtual visits over face-to-face -face, um, in, in most of our satisfaction scores. Huh. Okay. Um, I don't know if anyone saw it, but yesterday's Wall Street Journal had a large article about Amazon offering telehealth services to other U.S. firms this summer. And um, Apple, along with Amazon, is expanding its business to include electronic health records, uh, which contain data on diagnoses, prescriptions, and other medical information. Um, it, that's certainly creating opportunities, but it also creates privacy concerns. So um, how do you think Amazon and Apple will impact the general health public? Jared, you wanna take a shot yeah, at that? Yeah, I can talk about that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's overall, it's really good for, for digital care, right? I think it, from the big picture, when you see an Apple and Amazon, uh, you know, put their foot in, um, you know, it's a good thing. Now, that doesn't mean that they're, you know, we all hope they're successful. Microsoft has had a couple, they stubbed their toes a couple times on this, right? So um, we'll see what happens. But I think in terms of digital health, uh, it's a good thing, right? I think they're, you know, from what I understand, they're going to, they're going to kind of give this, give their, their employers, employees, uh, you know, access to telehealth, which I think is, is good for their, for their, employees is it's good for the amount of people that they employ right and so overall i think it's is good in terms of privacy um you know they're gonna it will we'll all be watching right in terms of you know how they how they kind of go through this but overall i think it's just another uh, adoption right in terms of an invalidation of this is healthcare this is what it's going to look like you know for the next 20 years and so i think it's a, overall i think it's a good thing for the market yeah, this is Dennis. I, I totally agree. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, for the digital uh, aspect of healthcare, I totally agree that, you know, it, it's nice to have an Amazon and Apple, you know, two large, well-respected names out there challenging um, our preconceived notions of healthcare, um, just in the same way as the pandemic challenged <laughs> our preconceived notions of healthcare. And it's, like I said, we, we, the word catalyst keeps com coming up because I think many of us have been waiting and embracing for or for this transformation that finally happened and those aligned incentives that Jared talked about earlier. What's more aligned than, than the safety of, of, of your patients and your providers during a, a pandemic that you don't know anything about, right? So now it's, now you have Amazon, Apple coming in with their, their digital prowess. I look forward to seeing what, what, they, uh, what kind of parts of healthcare they challenge so that we can react to it or you know, watch them stub the toe a couple times with with the, with the large pockets they have, which you know, which many of us don't have those pockets that we can we can uh, uh, make such uh, um, uh, risky bets, I guess you say. But uh, yeah, we're watching on the sideline, and I also know, you know, you, you've seen Amazon was part of the Haven uh, um, consortium that that was 
that kind of folded. Um, so it's, it's very obvious that it's not a very easy game to get into, but when you have that kind of pockets, we're willing to, to watch you and see what you can do. Um, Accenture did a, um, a study and they found that 60% of people want to continue to use technology more for their um, healthcare. Um, nine out of 10 patients said the quality of care was as good or better than before COVID-19. Um, one of the things they did say they wanted their healthcare facilities to mirror a hotel experience. Um, and so I, I would be curious to know what does that increased reliability on telehealth mean for the future of healthcare um, going forward? How will telehealth change healthcare as we move past the pandemic? Yeah, I'd like to start just, so, just with a short thing is that, you know, I think um, more of healthcare will move into the home as we're starting to see, whether it's digitally, uh, with, whether it's in home. Uh, ancillary services like blood draws, x-rays, um, and a lot of what even Jared's company is doing is it's, it's excellent where, you know, you're, you're post-discharge, you're checking on the patients digitally, right? And, and, that, and, and you do it on their own time. They don't have to come in to, to get uh, um, more uh, routine type uh, post-op or post-follow-up type, type checkups. So I think that's, that's going to be total game changers for, for, um, for just patients in general. So I, we saw, like Jason alluded to, we we are traditionally you know, 15 percent uh, of telehealth, 85 percent office pre-COVID, and within March of April 2020, we flipped the switch to become 85 percent virtual, 15 percent office. Wow! And then we we sustained that for nine months, where you know, we still have very heavy or majority virtual uh, encounter presence. And in that time, we saw the highest patient satisfaction in history of our organization, highest net promoter scores, where we were net promoter scores up with Apple. Um, we, our Google five-star ratings were the highest ever. So I think it, it mimics what, what you're talking about. You know, patients, um, this is the new norm for them and they're, they're, they're willing to adopt and your best expectation, your best experience anywhere becomes your expectation everywhere. So we're in an Uber society right now. We're in a Ritz Carlton society now. So yes, if you're going to go into the hospital, you're going to go into the clinic and we're more of the care is being transferred to the home. Then when you're experienced in the clinic, you're going to want a lot of it to come to you, whether it's your, your cardiologists and neurologists, you know, anyone, when you're in that hospital, you're going to want all of them to at least check up on you uh, digitally, virtually. And that's a lot of what we're building right now with my capital planning role at Kaiser Permanente. Okay. Um, what happens though, when you're dealing with folks who don't have a connection that's secure, um, that's reliable, what happens when you have people who are having problems just dealing with the technology altogether, either because of age or um, because of their medical conditions. Uh, I have to believe that those who are approaching senility um, might not be able to work their, fo their phones as well or their computers. They may not have, never have actually dealt with the computer. What do we do about them? Are we gonna lose them? Well, I, I think so. That, that's a that's that's really um, it's on both of us. It's on technology, and it's on the providers to kind of change their workflows and things like that. I think in tell you tell you at Health Talk, what we do is uh, with our outreach, being being able to scale and contact and, and connect with patients. Uh, what we do is we're helping those providers to not have to reach the ones that did connect, right? So we shrink that list down to folks that you're talking about. That may have issues with uh, connectivity or may have issues uh, interacting. What we've done is to, to address that is we can, we can interact with family members. So family members are, are partners in care, right? That essentially are those, uh, those patients you're talking about. So we can text those patients, uh, those patients' family members to get them, to get them engaged. We can help that. But we also, work on reducing the barriers as little as possible. For example, for Health Talk, there's no app. We are appless. So we elicit information just by testing it yes or no, one or two, right? So, and you, you'd be surprised at the ranges that we are getting and the responses we're getting in terms of that elderly population. 
Um, you know, my dad's 80 years old and he's a number one of the number one textures. So it is changing over time. That's not to say that, you know, that we're going to reduce it to zero. We won't, right? But we're going to give providers more time to actually find those patients connects with patients that don't have technology at all, right? Or essentially are challenged with it. So that, that's on us to help. I just recently did a, uh, a video visit with my 96 year old patient. Um, and uh, you know what, what's great about our, our uh, platform is we're able to bring in other family members as well and even interpreters. And so this was a 96 year old Spanish speaking male where we were able to bring in an interpreter and family members that um, were involved in care but don't necessarily live in the same home. And so we were able to have a nice family discussion and um, able to accomplish a visit that way. So um, as Jared and Dennis are saying, there's so many opportunities there from a provider standpoint to, uh, to set things up and prepare our patients. Okay, um, we've had a couple of comments in the chat having to do with insurance reimbursement and that before the pandemic, um, there really wasn't uh, reimbursement options. I mean, I know that's not a problem for KP because you are the you are the payer as well as the provider. Um, but has the pandemic improved enough that um, those folks are going to uh, those physicians are going to be paid back for their their time, their expertise, their telehealth visit? Yeah, I can speak for, for our customers that they are getting reimbursed, um, you know, and they're, they're, they have an array of different payers that, that they're getting reimbursed from. Uh, you know, initially it was, everything was gonna be covered in, in terms of COVID and then the last administration opened that up to, um, you know, 135 different diagnoses post follow-up. So that that's one of the things that we are focused in is in the emergency department where, um, follow-up visit used to have to be face-to-face -face in order to be reimbursed. And that's one of the things that we're helping with is automating that, that, that follow-up visit. There's a lot of things that have to happen with that um, that we help with, right? So the documentation, the consent, all those different things have to happen. Um, but yes, they, they, are getting, uh, they are getting reimbursed and they're getting reimbursed at a, a high enough rate that it makes sense uh, from a business perspective, business model perspective. Okay. Um, other than to ask the proverbial, what do you think is coming next? Um, I've, I've now gone through the questions that I had prepared. So uh, if anybody's got a question in particular, please let us know. Linda, um, uh, I was on mute, so I, I, um, I'm a little late to, to make this comment. Um, I can add a little bit to the insurance question. Um, oh, great. The, uh, you know, we hear different things, the, the, uh, you know, from different insurance companies and different providers, but I have heard that some providers are experiencing lower reimbursement uh, demands from health insurance, some health insurance companies for certain types of treatment, uh, because there's not the overhead expense um, involved. That, that's the argument they're making. So, uh, and I can't be very specific about what types of claims, but there are certain types of claims that uh, apparently, the insurance companies don't want to pay as much for uh, because they don't feel that the um, that the true cost to the physician and the amount of time that they're spending is the same as an in-person visit would be. Um, so, uh, I think there's that issue, and some of the legislative uh, actions to try to make telemedicine uh, be, uh, be to be sure that it's reimbursed at the same level. Is, is not indefinite and it may have to be revisited. So I think we're still facing some of these challenges on reimbursement. David, I think that's very interesting because um, if the infrastructure weren't there, the doctor wouldn't be able to provide the care that they're providing, mm -hmm. even if the patient doesn't have to come in for that specific appointment and it's another appointment down the road. <laughs> you're not gonna suddenly um, purchase a piece of equipment or rent an office just because you've got one um, patient coming in the door. 
It's really well, yeah, obviously, um, if the patient doesn't get the care, the insurance company stands to have higher claims later if the, yeah. if the patient ends up in the hospital. Um, so, you know, uh, the, the logic is there. Um, another thing I'll pass on, which is vaguely related to this, is that I was having a conversation with my own primary care physician. Um, I was in an in-office visit at that point, and we were talking about uh, how telemedicine was affecting him. And he said that he had to be pretty careful about what types of uh, treatments he's willing to make via telemedicine. He said he had one patient who had, had been involved in a motorcycle accident and, what, and wanted to do a virtual visit. And he, the doctor said, I'm sorry, you've got to go to the hospital um, or I have to see you personally. That's not the kind of, that's not the kind of treatment you, you, you would want to give virtually. So uh, there, there has to be some selectivity, I guess. Um, and I'm sure that liability is on their minds, um, you know, uh, in terms of whether they're able to give the same level of care. Yeah, this is Dennis. I, I totally agree. I, mean, I think you're, what you're talking about, about the telehealth parity uh, and many of the um, regulatory laxating that, that, that happened, I think there were like 100 different uh, telehealth bills that are out there or, or, or different changes because of the public health emergency. And I think the MedPAC and uh, uh, AHA, um, the, the Medicare Payment Advisory Committee and the American Hospital Association, uh, both of them have actually been urging to keep most of these uh, um, telehealth uh, favorable uh, uh, rules in to, to allow for us more to collect more data. Because like you were mentioning, um, is telehealth supposed to be a, a resolving um, a platform or can it be a triage platform? And do you reimburse them differently? As an emergency physician, I right. love that I can, you know, my patient doesn't have to go wait in an urgent care in the ER that I can see them on video within, you know, 30 minutes to the hour. And then the motorcycle accident guy can be, well, it little sound you have A, B, and C. Let's get you to an ER versus, oh, you just kind of dropped your bike. <laughs> you dropped your bike and, and twisted your ankle. Let's just get you to an x-ray um, and, 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 you know, coordinate that. So I, I totally agree with you. We, we have to probably dig a lot deeper and define what we should be reimbursing um, a little more clearly for, for our uh, providers and payers. Okay, um, Barry Lipsky had a very interesting question and he wants to know if it costs the same to the practice oh. and the provider um, or is it less for a telehealth visit than an in, in office visit? And what about visits that can now easily occur after hours if it a clinician wants to have late night hours. I was actually just following up on the comment you and David was making. Oh, okay. I think that was uh, which question. you know, because the premise from the insurers, uh, from the from the payers, is it costs less to have a visit. So I was, we've hypothesized, but I thought as long as we had the three uh, clinicians here uh, who were living this, do they have any insight? Actually, yeah, I, 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 back in about four years ago, I, I was pre-pandemic, um, during my executive MBA, that was actually one of my thesis projects was, you know, what was the cost savings of telehealth versus office visit for, uh, for same conditions? And then instead of just looking at it from, and I, I, we do want to drill down on, you know, on the, on the payer, what they're paying for it, but also you look at the system costs, right? What's the cost savings for the system as a patient and as, as a, a, a healthcare organization, you know, who saves more and, and what, is the, what is the breakdown? And we found that at Kaiser Permanente, uh, for instance, about two thirds of the saving is actually on the patient side. One third of the saving is on the organization side. And the system saving is actually huge. If you look at it more from, you know, opportunity cost for the patient, travel time, you know, all the, all the things that we kind of forgot about <laughs> during, the, during the pandemic a little bit, but <laughs> it's, it's all gonna come back sooner or later. And, you know, those are things that we gotta take into account. I mean. You know, I've got to take time off from work. Like I think someone mentioned earlier, I could just get on a telehealth. I think Jim mentioned it. I prefer to get on a telehealth visit because I'm busy and for routine things, I prefer this versus I have chest pain, get me to the right hospital and triage me in the right way. And I'm willing to do that by telehealth right now. So those are interesting uh, things to look at. As far as after hours, that is one of the battles we're having in our organization is that um, with the pandemic, with more telehealth, you're stretching the hours out, like many of us are doing in meetings sometimes, <laughs> probably eight o'clock meetings that wouldn't happen in normal, uh, the normal pre-pandemic world. Same thing happening with healthcare. We're stretching our physicians now 
into later night hours, more early hours, just provide more access and convenience and choice for the patients. So, you know, we are seeing a lot of that right now. And is that costing more in, in essentially uh, support staff time? I mean, if you're if you're seeing patients at eight o'clock at night, the office is closed. You got to do the you know, or, or are you taking more time just for the for the EMR updates uh, and the patient? So, you know, yeah. th that's why I'm asking the question. Is it truly less expensive for the provider? You kind of answered it if, since you dug into it for your MBA. But yeah, it's actually the same cost. If you think about for telehealth and that we don't need as much support staff. Um, and we're our virtual, so we're, we're remote. We're actually uh, working out of a VPN from our own homes. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, the cost is the same. Just now you start going um, you know, work-life balance, for well-being, and burnout. I mean, those are things that you don't think physicians would have as much conversation about that when you're saying, hey, working remote, <laughs> you're home. But I think anyone at any job, not just healthcare, but any job, you'll find your hours are stretched on out, uh, that the Zoom fatigue happens. Um, and, you know, the, I think the, it, it, it's a whole game changer now. I was about to ask you whether or not the physicians are burning out because as we discussed before everybody joined us, um, now in the Zoom world, you're facing a camera constantly um, and you don't have that downtime as much. And a physician going from tele telemedicine appointment to telemedicine appointment to telemedicine appointment is going basically from looking at the camera to looking at the camera to looking at the camera. Um, and is that burning your physicians out? No, I, I would say, you know, physicians in general have been really quite adaptable and resilient uh, throughout this whole process and um, have really welcomed uh, using technology to take care of their their patients um, and they they get excited about it you know I, just just the other day one of my colleagues was telling me that she was talking to one of her patients with high cholesterol it was a video visit and so she was talking to him about his statin and uh you know the mediterranean diet um and you know through our video we have screen sharing capabilities so they went online and looked up recipes for meal planning low salt stuff so it was really quick and easy and, and super satisfying because the patient didn't have to take any time off to come in and see us pay a copay and you know the physician felt like they got more out of that visit than they could have in the office setting um you know the patient kind of turned the camera and showed what was in his fridge and we were able to kind of or she was able to um kind of talk them through like here's the foods you want to continue to take this one you know you want to avoid there's a lot of salt content so very satisfying from that standpoint you know we we have uh uh, our patients with hypertension, we are able to send blood pressure monitors to their home for free, and they can uh, electronically send their blood pressure measurements back to us. And we have a dashboard uh, that where we can monitor our patient's blood pressure and titrate medications accordingly right through our email system, um, and then see how they're doing in real time. And it just gives us more information, more flexibility to do care, and we're not stuck in a 20-minute for, you know, wall uh, appointment, there's a lot more flexibility there. So I think there's there this this flexibility has really been a satisfier, honestly, for for physicians and for patients as well. Jason, yeah, you I, hit I on something thing. where you had mentioned about no copay. Um, are you losing in terms of what you're getting paid for that visit because you're not getting the copay? No, so, so video visits generally are free. There is a small subset where there's a, a very minimal copay. And um, it, quite honestly, it's not. Um, the way our, our model works, uh, this is all integrated in the services and the products that we provide. Okay. Um, so quite honestly, it, it's been great from that standpoint. The other thing that's interesting about the remote monitoring is some of the latest technologies that are coming online, uh, including one that was announced uh, at CES that is probably one of the closest things to uh, Leonard McCoy's uh, uh, tricorder that was about a matchbox sized device that gave a seven lead e EKG uh, as well as nine other parameters that you can essentially give and is so easy to describe. So I can tell you how to use it. You stick four fingers into it, touch it to your chest and you get all of that information. You can do it online. And interestingly, on the blood pressure thing that I think is huge opportunity is the potential to monitor past the single point of um, measurement, but continuous measurement. Some of the plethysmography 
uh, AI uh, tools that are coming out will offer that as a, a Fitbit style uh, thing. And that just becomes data that you get input and changes the way that you interact, I would think. Hmm. Absolutely. Um, and it, it's really easy to set up our patients as well. I mean, you know, if a patient comes into my office, their blood pressure is elevated, no symptoms, um, no history of hypertension, uh, you know, uh, what also could happen is, you know, they might just have white coat hypertension, you know, their blood pressure is up just from seeing me. Uh, it's a true phenomenon. One third of elevated blood pressures in clinic are actually attributed to white coat hypertension. So giving this device so they can check their blood pressure at home in a natural continuous environment is more accurate of a data than just simply just coming in and seeing me and getting that done there. So uh, that has its rewards there as well. I have white coat hypertension for sure. And I wear one occasionally, so. I should have taken my white coat off for the call. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, you had a question. Yes. Oh, hi, this is uh, Richard Singerman. Um, you know, it's wonderful that we're seeing the net promoter scores go up, but what about things like, uh, you know, safety, quality metrics, um, and, and more particular, uh, what the opportunity for doing research, telemedicine used to be niche, now you're doing it at scale. So what kind of initiatives do you have going on for uh, exploring the impact. Does someone getting telemedicine follow-up two months post-surgery actually have reduced infection, you know, reduced um, uh, uh, readmission rates, that kind of thing, you know, and recruiting patients to actually be willing to be part of this kind of studies? Yeah, so we, at, so at Kaiser Permanente, we have a dashboard on all of our patients. And uh, we are able to measure how they are doing with their blood pressure or their, um, their blood glucose levels to see how well controlled their diabetes are. And so um, folks that are enrolled in our remote data monitoring program, we watch very closely to see um, whether, you know, if this is producing results, and it certainly has been, and we're able to um, easily hit our metrics and our goals that are satisfactory or actually even above. Um, in, in almost all categories that are um, with the NCQA HEDIS metrics. And so um, we are seeing that um, scale out. What's also interesting with our dashboard is we're able to uh, get a list of our patients, those that are most vulnerable um, or have a difficult time coming in. So for example, I can filter my patient panel by let's say African-American and Latino population. Let's just look at what are the last six months of uh, those patients, their blood pressures, and then I can outreach them specifically and, and assess, hey, what are your barriers? Are you, are you able to come in? Any transportation issues? If so, here's the blood pressure cup. I'm sending it to your home. Why don't you plug this in? We have a care manager that's gonna work with you almost weekly. Uh, to, to make sure that you're able to uh, get your blood pressure medications. Our dashboard also lets us know if uh, folks are refilling their prescriptions. If they're coming about a month or two overdue when they should be due for their medications, that makes us think maybe there's some issue or barrier with compliance with the medicine. So we send them a reminder and we're able to mail their prescription out to them. So we try to give these resources uh, to our patients, but we're, we're not just reactive, we're proactive. We're, we're monitoring those vulnerable patients uh, and, and setting them up. So to answer your question, the remote data monitoring is certainly producing some really good results for us, and we're seeing our um, overall metrics improve. And are you allowed to make that like a, a research project, I don't know, to recruit people that, you know, let's say for whatever reason don't want to do telemeds, you can you can have an honest to God research result that's publishable because usually it's one thing to have these hospital operation improvements, but to actually make it as a published study, things have to be under an IRB supervision, that kind of thing. Are, are you able to do that um, with your population? Yeah, I, I can say, Richard. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, our research department, it's so funny. We've been doing this for seven years. And yeah. before COVID, it was like, I, I've got to pull teeth to get, to get a research department to help with telehealth because it wasn't the trending thing. It was more like this, this accessory, right? Then now with COVID, it becomes like, we want all the research to be about telehealth now, right? It's like Jason was alluding to, well, not only, you know, because telehealth now the extension for us at Kaiser Permanente is extension of our system. It's like, are we, um, are we meeting our, our proactive care metrics better? Are we, are we ordering the mammograms uh, uh, more quickly? Are we staying up to date with all the uh, colonoscopy ordering and, and all those and diabetes management? And 
if you compare, I mean, as Jason said, the access to the patients has actually improved a lot of these measures because it's so much more easy than to come in. And some patients may not come in for a year, but they'll do a telehealth visit and a snap of a finger. <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, it's been really helpful for us, but I think you're, you're totally right. There's so much more that we, we can look into now, now that we had our you know, 1 million visits last year, video visits and so much more of e-visits and other things. There's a robust bunch of data there. As far as controlled studies, uh, yeah, I'll have to <laughs> defer to our, our, our research department for that one and, and we'll look into it. Yeah, I can tell you um, from, a, from a study perspective, we are getting ready to launch. I don't know if every, anybody has heard of a new CMS program called uh, ET3, uh, which is basically emergency triage and transport. Uh, it's a new CMS model where, where we're gonna be involved in paratelemedicine. And uh, this is gonna be studied from the jump. So essentially the idea is that um, uh, a lot of times their patients are transported to hospitals that don't need to be transported. Uh, and so what we're doing, what we're going to be helping doing is with our partners is essentially helping with that paratelemedicine visit in the home. So a paramedic arrives, they're not, they have a, a triage that they have to follow. They, they're, they're not sure whether they need to, they, they need to uh, transport. And so uh, we're going to be the platform that actually help, helps with that telemedicine um, platform. And so we have a, a capability that helps kind of queue up the next next physician, we start texting physicians, the ones that are on call, and we make that connection. And so the question is, from a CMS perspective is, will this, you know, reduce, um, will this reduce the overall cost, right? Because you're not going to have uh, patients essentially um, transport that don't need to be transported. Uh, it also kind of, kind of cross sects the question of the cost in, in terms of telemedicine in general will reduce costs uh, from a care perspective. And I think the thing is, is that from, we need to think in terms of not cost necessarily, but value, right? What's the value to the patient, what's the value to the system? And it's really gonna depend on what's happening with the state. So we're really excited to be a part of this ET3. Uh, it's gonna be studied from the very beginning in terms of the quality metrics. It's a five-year program for CMS. Uh, in terms of that. So um, this is an, an opportunity that telemedicine from a CMS perspective will be studied from day one. So we'll keep you posted. That, that's great. Is that, so is that telemedicine that the patient already has in their home or, no. or is the paramedic carrying this with them? So the paramedic is going to be carrying a tough book or an iPad, right? And essentially they're going to be using Health Talk uh, to generate a telehealth visit with a remote provider like like Dennis or Jason. And what our system does is we have a list of providers that we know that are on call and we start texting these doctors wherever they are. Think of it as Uber, right? It's, it's a very similar concept, right? Paramedic, and what we do is essentially from a bot perspective is we get that provider, hey, are, can you take this call or not? And the provider says, yep, I can take the call, good. And then we send them the link paramedic and the provider are connected with, right next to the patient and essentially then the then the provider does the does the telehealth visit in the home and the provider makes the decision we you need to transport uh but it's not just transport to emergency department it could be this is what CMS, cms is hoping transport to primary care this 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 patient is not well not sick enough to go to emergency department but need some care now, we'd like you to transport that, that patient, the patient to a lower cost of care. Uh, so this is where telemedicine and, and, and thankfully we're grateful that Health Talk is gonna be at the, the very beginning of this and we'll see where it goes. It's called ET3. Any other questions that are out yeah, there? Yeah, I've, I've got one, um, it's kind of a modified version of the insurance question. I wanted to ask Dennis specifically, the extent to which at a corporate level, being payer and provider made the process of establishing this much wider application uh, of, of telehealth easier and whether that also applies across other areas of running the system because you're the only person in the room who's actually running the system. Everyone else is running a piece of the system. 
Yeah, it's kind of funny that when we started doing this six, seven years ago, I think that's where, it, to me, it was a no-brainer. I mean, you're a captated uh, model, right? You're, you're integrated. It, it was a no-brainer that telehealth can, can be an extension of your system, but also add so much more efficiencies and productivity within the system, right? Um, and that's what I, mean, I preached this for so many years. I mean, J Jason is a believer. He's one of my partners in all this, but uh, it, it was it was hard to get get that adoption. But um, but you're right. It was easy to implement. Um, yes, the, the technology was easy. Uh, the processes were easy to integrate. I mean, everything we integrate with our Health Connect, which is our Epic based EMR. Um, the hard part, as in any other system at pre COVID, was uh, adoption from uh, from providers. Right, we we didn't go to medical school and residency and learning it back when I was, and then it's part of the curriculum now. But it wasn't part of that. So getting our providers to believe that this was a, a um, uh, acceptable way to provide care, especially knowing that we we are the system, we 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 are the whole continuum from the digital or call center all the way to the follow up, and and it it's in our our line incentives to to keep you healthy and make you healthy. Um, you know, we don't, it's not fee for service where now I'm going to make more money and the more times you, you, you touch the system, actually, actually the, the more resourceful we are, um, it, it actually works the best for everybody. So, those right, so it's from, from a, from a system perspective, being both payer and provider helped significantly, yes, but sir. you still had that human barrier to adoption. Of course. I mean, the human barrier is okay. always there. I mean, that's, yeah, that's where, of course. Yeah, and, and humans are logical. I mean, especially as physicians, you're very uh, critical, right? And you're, you're, you're critical and you're skeptical, especially you're, you're the advocate for your patients. So, you know, we, we had to really year after year um, uh, get those champions that, that really can show how you can use technology to really improve the, the, the quality, the efficiency, productivity, everything that the financial guys like and then the, the clinical guys like. Right. Thank you. Great question. Anyone else? Well, um, I, we may actually end early, Nick. David, do you have anything that you want to add or? Can I ask one additional question? Absolutely. Uh, I, was typing, uh, I was typing it in as you were saying that. Uh, from what uh, Dennis was just saying, you're talking about the ability to do more preventive care it makes it a little, a little easier. You guys are, have been all in emergency med, medicine. To what extent do you see this technology genuinely being uh, used for preventive medicine? And I'm not talking about just the checkups and does somebody have to be, you know, can, can you do the visit, but actually proactively work, uh, working with a patient to keep them healthy. Um, I'll, I'll actually just, just touch on this. I think Jason could probably do a better job with this being a primary care physician, but yeah. as an emergency physician, it's interesting because I trained in Detroit. <laughs> so, you know, it was, it was very much a, a treat them and street of environment. You know, you, you don't know what's going to happen. There's no integration with primary care in, in, in Detroit, or very little at least. So I don't know what happens to a patient when they, when they left my ER. And you know, there's been many sleepless nights where I, you know, you always wonder what, what's happening to the patient. And that's what drew me to, to an organization like Kaiser Permanente, where that integration, the continuity of, of the data and, and being able to check up on, on, on patients was huge. But what also changed as, as becoming a permanent physician was as an emergency physician, I am part of the care team. So if the patient sees me and it's Jason's patient and they, they're due for their mammogram or they're due for their, their colon screening or you know they, they need refills on whatever medication they need or, or lab work to, to be done or smoking cessation, I mean, the list goes on I think it's partly my responsibility, and we, we kind of built that into our culture. Even as even as emergency physicians that don't carry a, a pager, <laughs> we you know we we are is still part of the team and it's part of our responsibility. And we're starting to be held up to those me metrics too. We have to review the diagnoses and 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 check to make sure that we're um, we're doing many of the things, not everything that a primary care doctor can do, but many of the things that that they can do because we don't know when that patient is going to touch the system again. So. That culture has been has been huge for us. I'll let Jason take over that that point. No, I, I, Dennis uh, summarized it really well. You know, because we're such an integrated system, um, anyone can do preventive care. Our cardiologist can order a mammogram. You know, I had a patient that went to the pharmacy to pick up their prescription. 
because we're all one electronic medical record system, they also have the same EMR and the pharmacist reminded the patient to go do her mammogram and get labs done for her diabetes. Um, and, you know, any primary care center, we do digital retinal scans to screen for diabetic retinopathies, and those scans are automatically sent to ophthalmology to review, so we don't have to call and schedule and set up a follow-up for, for our patients. And so, from that standpoint, it's been really helpful. Patients that are due for mammograms, right, uh, these are automated reminders to our patients with the scheduling ticket they can click into and schedule a appointment for their mammogram, and those results are relate to them within 24 hours, uh, most often right before they even leave, uh, which is just incredible at, at the speed that things are done. Um, and so we do see a lot more automation in preventive care. Um, the goal is really just to make it as easy and remove a lot of processes between the patient and their care. And so uh, doing a lot of the automation and uh, using the electronic medical record system and the resources around us that we already have has made that possible. Um, you know, one thing I was gonna mention uh, you know, we, we were talking on the various like just modalities for, for virtual care. Uh, Telederm, that continues to just blow up. I mean, you know, patients can take a picture of their, you know, funny looking mole and, and send it to us and we can, uh, through their kp.org app, and we can send it to the dermatologist for them to review it and have a diagnosis and a prescription ready for them, which is just really amazing. I mean, just the other day with one of my patients, she's she's a single mom, three kids, all doing distant learning. Bless her for do, uh, taking all that. She could not take time off to come see me to see her, do her uh, to take a look at her rash. And so she took a picture of it, sent it on kp.org, dermatology reviewed it. We had a diagnosis and a medication in the pharmacy getting ready to be mailed out to her all within that same day. So if you think about it, she didn't have to take any time off to come drive and see me, to pay a copay to see me, only to be referred to a dermatologist where outside of Kaiser Permanente it could be two to three months down. We can get you in the same day if we needed to, but she didn't have to do that or pay an extra pay for that as a uh, copay for a dermatologist. All this stuff we could easily do just through our portal system. So it's just a matter of um, both educating providers and patients of all the possibilities that we can do electronically. And that includes preventive care. Thank you. Yeah, I can tell you one other thing in terms of like, so one of one of the use cases that, that Health Talk helps with is ED, sorry, as my dog uh, decides he needs a new spot, uh, is, is ED follow-up. Um, and and I can tell you, it's it's interesting because like like Dennis was saying, the, the normal flow is once you leave the ED, we don't hear from you again. But since uh, ED telehealth follow-up is is available now uh you know a lot a large part of the population doesn't have a primary care doctor uh, they're not fortunate enough to be part of uh, kp so uh what what are the physicians that they use health talk are seeing is that they they feel fortunate because it'll be two or three days later they're doing a telehealth follow-up that's scheduled via via health talk and delivery via health talk but something else will come up and it's an opportunity for them to say oh you know okay that's a new problem you know, and, and here's what you should do. Here's what you think. And, and let's send a med medication because they're more than happy to do that if they don't have a primary care. And if they do have a primary care, then it's like, okay, well, who's your doctor? You know, they try to give them the resources. And then it is causing somewhat of a friction too, though, with EDs because EDs are essentially is a new kind of thing in terms of, so now these new relationships are being formed in terms of, okay, if we do the ED follow-up, we have to make sure that these other organizations are, are kept in the loop in terms of that. So now how can health talks bringing, being brought into these conversations is, well, how do we help now with these new problems from the, from the telehealth visit that have been, that follow-up television that, that have been uncovered that we can help with referral tracking. And so it's, I think it's just going to be an evolution of, of how we can help in terms of uh, the virtual care, but it's, it's, it's changing as we speak. You know, there's something that, um, that reminds me of, I, I had a similar um, you know, uh, incident to the one Jason mentioned. I had I had a, a, a minor infection in one of my fingers um, and did a, a telehealth visit with my primary care physician, showed him the finger. Um, he could see the level of inflammation and he immediately prescribed uh, an, an antibiotic to me. Uh, that same, I was able to pick it up that same day um, and I was, 
concerned about it because I was at the time it, at our second home in Delaware and my primary care physician is in Virginia. So that would have meant traveling, you know, back to Virginia to see the primary care physician. Um, and, you know, one thing that, that brings to light is that um, the regulations have been relaxed at least uh, for a while in terms of where the physician has to be licensed. So a Virginia, a, a physician sitting in Virginia was treating a patient, me, in Delaware and, and issuing a prescription to a Delaware pharmacy. Several years ago, that wouldn't, that wouldn't have been legal. Um, in, in some of the early telemedicine work that, um, that I've done as an attorney is trying to figure out what each state's regulations are about the types of contacts that a physician can have uh, with a patient who is out of state. Um, but I think as part of the pandemic, um, there, were, there were some regulations passed by DHHS uh, that relaxed those requirements so that people could, um, could get virtual care more easily. But that, that may come back, we'll have to see. Um, there were certain types of, of visits you could do virtually um, uh, uh, and certain you could not uh, according, to the, according to the laws. But it certainly was convenient in my case. And um, if you're in a, in a jurisdiction like DC, uh, where there is three different states involved, uh, obviously it makes it easier as well. There was just a, there was just an editorial on that, the New England Journal, on the different options of well, their editorial recommendations of di evaluating different options of cross-state physician coverage. David, if you're interested. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, yeah, I, can I make an announcement? Sure. So uh, just real quick, uh, folks. Uh, first of all, Jason, Dennis, it was great to meet you guys. And, um, and Jared, and Jared, it looks like you have a great black lab, if I could tell. <laughs> yeah. um, but I have just started a new role as VP of Clinical Research for Day-to-Day -day Health, which is a uh, telemedicine and a healthcare coaching company out of Boston uh, and India. Uh, backed by a large healthcare firm, uh, Babylon Health in, um, in Britain. And so I'm very excited about talking to folks about doing uh, research for telemedicine and the associated coaching at scale uh, for across the clinicians, both the primary care docs, the ED docs, and folks like the physiotherapists, the rehab specialists. I know Doug has worked in some of that area, uh, the dietitians. So if folks want to uh, talk to me or connect about the potential research. I'd uh, happy to get looped in. Jason, Dennis, maybe uh, you know, feel free to uh, email me. It's just my name, Richard Singerman at gmail.com. And um, we can uh, maybe uh, connect a little bit more to the research folks. Richard, congratulations on your new job. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, that's I'll, even, great. I'll even put my email in the chat here for, um, for folks. So, uh, There you go. Okay. So the email is in and, the chat. And Jim loves the anecdote so much. He wants to know whether or not um, our speakers have seen or can speculate about the effect of this technology on patient loyalty, either to you specifically or to your organization. So um, Jason, Dennis. Yeah, so uh, patients that are on uh, our Barry? portal system, um, kp.org, we have increased patient retention on that. Um, this was actually a study that came out of Kaiser in California many years ago and saw that patients more likely renewed their service with Kaiser if they were on uh, active on kp.org, our portal system. So we do see that as a, as a evidence for loyalty. Jared, do you see that happening with some of your physician groups? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the use cases, um, you know, uh, for health talk is so what, what, again what we do is we engage patients on behalf of providers and we have a conversation an automated conversation to identify a gap and so i'd say about half of our customers use health talk to identify to identify a patient experience or quality gap we ask a couple questions the main thing we do is we facilitate a customer recovery so if there is an issue in terms of patient to not have a good experience um, and this is mainly in the ED is the work that we're doing, then we facilitate a callback with a physician. And so we have lots of different case studies that we're actually, we've moved the needle quite a bit in terms of HCAPS and HCAPS is a CMS survey. And so 
we provide, if HCAPS is kind of your rear view mirror uh, for providers, we're kind of the front windshield, right? So we give the providers the tools to actually do something about it. And we absolutely have seen that our technology um, and, and along with, you know, best practices, what to say to customers, what to say to patients in terms of when they do have this, this, these interactions uh, together, uh, it definitely has increased uh, HCAPS and, and loyalty for our customers. So we're, we've been fortunate to, to check the box on that one. I, if, if I can just, I'm sure somebody on this call knows or would have a reference. I, I don't know what the number is, but from the payer perspective, I'm sure it's, uh, they've, they've got a number of how much it costs to recruit one new member. And if you can increase retention and document the economic effect of that, I would think that would have the chance of overwhelming the discussions that go on about the relative office expense of doing telemedicine versus in person. So it's, and but you don't hear that talked about a lot and I, I don't know why, but that's interesting information. No, but I think that one of the things you'd be concerned about is if, as David said, people were getting less of a reimbursement because the um, yeah. payer was thinking that the overhead shouldn't come into place, but you've got patients who are much more likely to stay with that physician because of the telehealth. Mm -hmm. It becomes a, I would think that it becomes or could become a hardship for the physician if they're spending more time on telehealth um, calls than they were, but they're not getting paid what they should be. Yeah, I, well, I, I think that's what, what KP has figured out, right? They, they, they have figured out in terms of they, they have aligned all their incentives, right? In terms of that. So we talked about in the first five minutes of the call. You know, I think it's, uh, for example, you know, this ET3 I brought up, um, hospitals in Virginia, I'm not going to like it so much, right? Because essentially um, they're not very captated. Right, there are a lot of the, most of the hospital systems in Virginia are are kind of fee for service, and they don't have a lot of uh, value based contracts. Uh, ET three will probably be very successful in Maryland, where a lot of their hospital systems are captated. So, it's a you know it's one of those things that it, the business model is going to matter um, for sure. So, in any case, it's uh, it's one of those things that we've you know that there's only so much that technology can do. Uh, the, the regulations and the business models have to um, lean in this direction for this to all work. Well, gentlemen, thank you for your input this afternoon. I think that I can speak for the group to say that this was quite um, illuminating. Very um, interesting. Thank you Jim, very much. David, I, I give it back to you. I would just say thank you very much. It was incredibly interesting. It's a great in set of insights, and we will look forward to seeing you all in April. And we appreciate your engagement. It's a great energy. It's really fun. It's a fun group. I've always enjoyed talking to you guys, and it's fun to come back. So thanks again for having me. Thank you. Great. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. So much. Thanks, everybody. That's the end of the uh, uh, formal presentation and also the end of uh, this uh, particular recording. Uh, this is Health Tech Net. And we meet every month. Bye, everybody.